Hey, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. And today I'm reviewing Lords of Hellas Spy Awaken Realms. And I don't often do this, but can we can we look at the, the box and my background and the color coordinated orange and blue? I mean, look at that. It's pretty cool, right? Now, that said, this is not the point of the review, but I sometimes get lost sometimes. So, Lords of Hellas is a game that I've had in my collection since late 2018. I did not back the Kickstarter, but I traded for a copy after I kind of got into the whole Kickstarter game late 2018 and rapidly tried seeking down, well, far too many games than I should. Now, I've had it in my collection, like I said, already since late 2018. In September 2020, I put out a video of the 10 games in my collection that I most want to play from my unplayed games, and Lords of Hellas made the list along with well, nine other games. I think I think there were actually only... No, there were 12 games on the list now that I think about it. From those 12 games, I have played six of them now, including Lords of Hellas. Six of them are still staring at me on the shelves, unplayed. Not the focus of this review, but it is what it is. And before we get into the review, before we get into how you play the review, all of that, understand that Lords of Ragnarok is going to be coming to Game Found from Awaken Realms, a spiritual, not spiritual, a successor, a standalone game in the Lords of Hellas universe, bringing you more gorgeous miniatures, likely more gorgeous miniatures, as Awaken Realms tends to constantly be upping their game, and supposedly changes to the gameplay that make it a game worth checking out. I don't have a full breakdown of those changes. Rest assured, I will have more content on this channel around Lords of Ragnarok when it's going up and all that kind of stuff. But, Lords of Hellas. Now, this won't be a full how to play because there's a lot of small things going on in this game. It's actually not that hard to teach the core concept of what you're doing, but the small intricacies of the various things that are going on can sometimes be a bit overwhelming. The, the short aspect of what you need to know is Lords of Hellas is going to be an area control game with powers and abilities left, right, and center in different ways. It's going to be a game where you win one of three ways, although technically one of four ways. One of three ways. Those three ways are going to be either if your hero runs around the board conquering monsters, keep in mind these three things over here, those are monuments, not monsters, and in fact you will, I want to say never, ever see all three of them built on the board like that. We'll come back to that. But if you go ahead and you kill three monsters in the game, well, you win. That's one way of winning the game. The other way of winning is if you look around the board, you'll see different color-coded sections. We have red, we have yellow, we have blue, we have green, and we have gray over here. Keep in mind, I am only reviewing the base game content here. There is a lot of additional content. I have not explored any of it yet. And to that area, those five different areas over there, if at any point in the game you control two full areas, well, that's way number two that you win the game. And the third way you win the game is throughout the course of the game, you're going to be building a variety of temples in different locations. Wherever there's a temple spot, you have the option of building a temple. We'll talk about the turn structure shortly. If at any point you control five areas with temples in them, that's way number three you win the game. Now, I mentioned there was a fourth way, and that fourth way is you see these monuments over here? Well, these monuments actually... I mean, the, this way, the first time my kids played with this game, they thought they had broken the miniatures. They're like, no, we broke your miniatures, and they know that... Breaking the miniatures is a great way for them to not be playing with it. But you see, these miniatures are going to start on the board as just the pure base, like so. The first time you take a build monument action, you're going to add a level. And then again, as you do it again, that's not the right piece. That looks like the right piece. Then again, and then again. So you're going to be slowly but surely building these monuments throughout the course of the game. And as soon as you have one monument fully built, as soon as a single monument is fully built, you're going to then trigger a, n a new countdown timer for the game. What's going to happen is at the end of the third round at that monument is built, whoever controls that spot, doesn't matter if other monuments are built along the way, but once any one monument is built, three rounds from now, whoever controls that specific singular area, well, that player wins the game. The other areas, the other ways of winning are still in effect. The other ways of winning are still viable options. But it effectively sets a timer on the game. A timer with a slow countdown in which bloody war will ensue in a single area. Unless, of course, you somehow trigger the end game through another one of the three options. That's going to be how Lords of Hellas is effectively, well, won. As far as how you play it in the game... You're going to be going round and around as players taking a bunch of actions. On every single turn, you can take four basic actions. The basic actions are going to be moving some units around the board, not a lot. Alternatively, moving your hero around the board to either fight monsters, to move to different areas, or to accomplish quests. You can move into regions with quests. Let's find a hero. You can move into a region with a quest, and then move up on the quest track to try to accomplish quests, getting various bonuses. You can also put your priests on a track. You're going to earn priests through a variety of ways. You will not start the game with them. But when you have these priests, you can basically take them and put them into to one of the monuments to up one of your stats if that guy doesn't fall over. You're going to put it down different in, into different monuments to the bases. 
and then up various stats and getting benefits along the way. And then the fourth action is using artifacts. From those four actions, priests and artifacts will be more situational because artifacts only refresh when you actually take a build monument action. And priests are going to frequently be running out of, at least until you get more to mid late game where you'll have more of a supply built up. So the first two actions, moving units and moving your heroes are going to be the four, the two primary actions from those four that you will frequently be taking. When you're done with your actions, again, you can take up to all four if you're able to, you will then move to taking one of the core actions on your player board. We have a player board over here, and this player board, you have a few actions you can take. You can prepare, build temple, hunt, recruit, usurp, and march. And then finally, you can build a monument. And each of these actions, what you're going to do is you're going to pick one of them. Perhaps I want to build a temple. I'm going to build a temple, uh, build a temple in a location, and then I'm going to cross that off. I can no longer take that action until I've basically taken a build monument action, or more specifically, until any player has taken a build monument action. So the build monument action is sort of the timer that runs the game down. Now, let's go through those actions because they're worth covering. There are a lot of the core mechanisms of the game. Build temple is going to involve you grabbing a temple from the sideboard over here and adding it to a region that you control with a temple. Additionally, depending on which temple you're taking, you may trigger a mid-game draft where you'll be drafting a whole lot of fun powers and abilities that everyone's going to be getting, but the person who built the temple gets first pick and... Well, it is powers and abilities. Next up, you'll have recruit. For every city you could, for every area you control with a recruit area, for everyone with the city, you're going to go ahead and recruit two units to the board. Although if you control this area over here, you'll you'll recruit four. So that's going to be how you're getting more people on the board through a recruit action. Then you're going to have the march action, which is the primary way you're going to be moving larger blocks of units around the board. The basic unit action in this game is usually involving units up to your leadership stat. So your leadership stat, which starts at one, means you can move one unit around the board. Not very convincing, but your march action means you can move an entire regiment of units across the board. But again, you have to take it less frequently because you have to, someone has to build a monument before you can do it again. Usurp is going to be when you are the hero of a region. When you're the hero of a region, you'll get a specific token defining you as the, the hero of that region, although it's temporary. We all praise only one leader at a time, and that will allow you to move into er any area in that region and completely eject whoever is currently in control of the region and adding your own unit without any battle. The people recognize your valor, your might, and they basically cede the entire city to you. We're going to have Hunt, which is how you actually start a fight with a monster. You're going to have to have a hero in the region with any one of these monsters, and then start the fighting process, which is probably the most complicated part of the game. We won't heavily get into it. Then we have a Prepare, where you can choose any two actions. You can choose any combination of two, including the same one twice. You can heal an injury on your hero. Your stats will effectively be hurt when you take injuries, and you can heal those. You can draw combat cards, which will help you in battle against monsters or other players, or you recruit, recruit hoplites into regions with yourself. The last action is going to be that build a monument action. You're going to grab a region that has a partially built monument and you're going to add a level of the monument to it. You're also going to refresh your artifacts, clear all player boards, draw, draw an event from the, the, the deck over there, and that's basically going to be the sequence of play. So once again, Lords of Hellas. You win it one of three ways with a fourth way, either fight three monsters, either control two full areas, or control five areas with a temple, and then the fourth way is controlling a fully built monument three turns after it's built. The turn structure is effectively going to be taking to, taking basic actions, such as putting priests into monuments to get benefits, moving your hero on the board, moving some basic units around the board, some, not all, and then using artifacts, followed by one of a few core actions that will then be reset once someone takes a build monument action. Lots of other small stuff going on in the game, like the artifacts you have to be mindful of, your hero starting abilities, the various rewards you get for putting a priest on your monument, depending on the level of said monument, the higher the level, the more benefits you get, as well as the monsters, which is going to be an aspect of, of player versus environment combat, although you usually have another player playing the monster. And to that end, fights with monsters are going to be back and forth with your hero playing cards to try to wound the monster. Every round you must wound the monster. If you don't inflict an additional wound, the fight is over and the monster is left weakened for the next player. And then if you do inflict additional wounds again and again and again, eventually you will win the monster, getting its artifact and or other benefits and becoming hero of the region. Fights versus players are going to involve this combat deck, same as the monsters, although using different aspects on the combat deck. And they're basically going to be involved and in, going to be adding your, your, your unit's strength to the board, plus adding cards and their abilities and strength to the combat going back and forth. Lastly, I do want to cover the blessings because the blessings are easily my favorite part of the game. 
The blessings are going to be decks of cards that, like I said already, whenever you have specific temples put on the board, you're going to initiate a draft of these blessing cards. These blessing cards are going to be, you're going to grab, let's say if you're playing a four player game, you'll grab one plus the number of players, or five in this case, and then you're going to go ahead and take a look at these abilities that will break the game in different ways and pick one. Now I haven't looked at these. We have, when you use a special action prepare, draw one additional combat card. Effectively, whoever takes combat training, their prepare action is better. They've just added a full extra combat card to their, to their pull. We have weak spot. At the start of a hunt, discard one combat card to deal a wound of any type. That's going to give you a lot of flexibility if you are taking the path of fighting monsters. Then we're going to have bluff. In battle, when you and your, both you and your enemy pass while playing combat cards, you can play an additional combat card, which can be very helpful. You can pass and then keep going. Forced March is going to be when you take the action March, you may, you may move your army by two regions, giving you a game-breaking amount of extra movement as you move armies in much larger spheres across the board. And Heroic Presence. If a battle is taking place in a region your hero is in, add two to your army strength. Heroes normally don't affect battle unless you have an ability around it, and that would be an ability around it. And you're going to be drafting those cards, usually a minimum of four times per game, which means you're going to be building up a tableau of powers and abilities, which is a good time to start talking about the things I like in this game, because if you've watched my content, you know powers and abilities is right at the top of the list. Lords of Hellas has powers and abilities. It has powers and abilities from the various uh, heroes you're going to start with. It has powers and abilities from the blessing cards you're going to gather, from the combat cards. Blessing cards, like I said already, are my favorite part, giving you basically building up a tableau of how you are different, special, and better than your opponents in this game. There's going to be a lot of other ways you can get things. Every time you defeat a monster, you get an artifact that can be used to, again, make yourself you know, better than other players. You're going to have quests you can go on, quests that will give you various things, possibly artifacts, possibly units, all these things giving you just more and more stuff and we're not even talking about the expansions, which, like I said already, I have not played with, but I have kind of glanced at some of them, and they add even more ways to augment, to add, to develop, to separate yourself from other players, and just give you more and more things in this game. The art and miniatures. I mean, this is Awakened Realm. I mean, look at these people on the board. I couldn't resist. I, in theory, these, these monuments should all be not really built when showing the game in this setup state, but I, I kind of wanted to have them all set up. Because as beautiful as these miniatures are, left, right, and center, from the very small units to the mid-sized monsters to the giant monuments, sadly the monuments are never really fully built to this extent. And there are a variety of other expansion monuments as well, all giving you different ways, different decks of cards. The Blessings deck is going to be a subset of the various cards related to each of these three gods specifically. Losing combat in this game fits one of the things that I consider an essential component of any area control game that I love, which is combat is meaningful and important, but it's not game-breaking punishing. I like it in area control games where the combat, it's important to win the combat, that is how you win the area control aspect of the game to a certain degree, but you don't want it to be destructive, you don't want it to feel like you lost a single battle and now it kind of ruins your game, and Lords of Hellas achieves that. Losing battle often results in one or two casualties, and that's basically it. You're losing control of a region, you're not losing full complements of troops, so the combat in this game is incredibly meaningful. The choice of when to commit more cards, saving them for this battle or the next battle, which one is going to be more instrumental? Do you want to control that temple? because controlling temples is essential. Whenever you build a monument, you're going to get more priests depending on how many temples you control. And of course, it's a game-win condition because if you control five temples, well, that's important. But then again, you might also be trying to go for regions or maybe trying to stop somebody else from winning this game. And so combat is incredibly important, incredibly meaningful, and yet it's not punishing when you lose. And this game has multiple paths to victory literally in the way the game is played. This is not some like, you know, going to some final close but different destinations along the way. This is literally genuinely multiple paths to victory. You can win by just literally fighting monsters the entire game and not worrying about the rest of the board either. But if you don't control the rest of the board, you're not going to be strong enough. You're not going to be getting extra benefits in the game. So there is a constant balance as to what path you're pursuing and what peripheral aspects you're going for. Fighting monsters can be helpful whether or not you're going for the monster strategy. And getting areas on the board is helpful when you are going for the monster strategy. Different aspects are taken into account on this game. And the game has a timer built in. I like the fact that the game as you build these monuments, as you slowly move to a close, eventually you hit a point where there's three turns left. And now someone has to win the game, either through one of the three conventional methods, or alternatively through that final last battle. Now in my games, I've yet to actually have anyone win through that final last battle. It has always come to a close before that, but it has come close as people start prepping and moving towards Zeus because suddenly his monument is built. And we have three turns now. There's going to be an area of control there along the way until, of course, 
Now that you're distracted, somebody ends up winning the game through having five temples or control or the monsters or anything like that. Tons of powers and abilities, tons of expansions, tons of content for this game. There's a few things I didn't like in this game, and to begin with, knowing other players' blessings and tableau is slightly irritating. And this is something that is a common issue in games like Lords of Hellas, in games like Kemet. Any game that has a lot of other things going on that isn't pure, simple, refined elegance is going to have that aspect of, I know my tableau and I know what makes me special, but... I kind of have to know what makes you special as well, because I'll suddenly end up in a combat with you, and before I even know it, you'll be like, uh, yeah, you can only play one card in combat against me, because you have the defensive bonus over there, and I forgot. Sure, you told me when you drafted it, hopefully, if you're a good sport, but there's going to be a chunk of, first of all, your default player ability, your hero's ability is going to be in front of you, and you're going to have to remember that, but then you're going to remember, have to remember everything else that player has drafted, the artifacts they have, the blessings they have. It has frequently resulted in small little combats that I thought were going to go one way, but ended up going another way. And then secondly, and differently, is going to be board positioning here. Lords of Hellas has a board where different areas are, well, further apart than others. And I'm saying this as someone who's a fan of Blood Rage, a fan of Kemet, a fan of Cyclades and Inish, games that often the, the whole area is much more confined. Everything's kind of accessible in a much more easily, well, accessible fashion. But in Lords of Hellas, you're going to often wind up in states where you have a player slowly going for control of two different areas down here, and then the players who actually have military might are too far away to actually do anything, which results in some poor guy over there who has to kind of step in to interrupt this person from winning, even though they're basically giving up their entire board state to do so, but they're the only one who can actually reach. Sometimes in Lords of Hellas, the very geography of the game will force people to make subpar decisions just in the interest of stopping, stopping somebody else from winning this game. As far as I can see others not liking about the game, to begin with, this game is going to have a common aspect in many area control games, which is that target the leader aspect. You're going to have someone who looks like they might win. Oh, look over there, Jan's about to get these two areas, he's about to win fully through area control. And like I touched upon a second ago, someone else has to rush in and stop him, prepping somebody else to be ready to go. Oh, look, they're going for the monsters, and there's another monster he's going to get. You have to fight the monster, take it down, you have to go ahead and commit all your cards. And then now that you've done so, someone else can wander into your area, stopping you from winning. This game has, to a certain extent, that target the leader, that pull down the leader aspect, where somebody might have to be the last person to survive the assault and the onslaught of the other players, more so than anything else. Secondly, losing to a monster in this game might be something you find frustrating. You might commit a lot of troops' time and energy to fighting a monster, only to have it so you weaken the monster for the next player but don't actually do anything yourself, and that can be frustrating. It can feel like not only a wasted turn, but setting someone else up for an easy victory because the monster does stay weakened. Now, to that end, it's worth noting that whenever you fight a monster, you will likely get something from it. You'll get less of a reward if you don't kill it, but it is something to be mindful of. Sometimes you are just helping somebody else defeat the monster in this game. And then lastly, as far as I can see, I was not liking, it's going to be potential OP strategies. Now, what I mean by that is... I've seen a lot of talk, and it's going to be different depending on your group, depending on the players, depending on your own experience, but I've seen a lot of talk or comments about the monster strategy being overpowered, the monster strategy being the way you can win, because after all, the monsters have, once you kind of defeat a monster, you, you have one of your three monsters done, and you can keep going and go on from there, versus the area control aspect is always a bit more of a push and pull on the board. Fighting a monster, the only way to stop somebody from winning that, that way is to take down a monster before they do, and you always run the risk there of, well, weakening the monster for him. So that's something to be mindful of there. That said, in our group, I would say that the monster strategy hasn't actually been that impactful. Rather, we've seen the temple strategy being the most common win as people are constantly paying attention to, oh, you know, you got yellow and red, you're prepped for the victory there, they got two monsters, and then suddenly somebody pipes up, I have four or five temples, I win the game. So different strategies may seem overpowered or underpowered, I don't know. In our group, like I said already, we've seen more of temple wins, but I've seen more people talk about monster wins, and I don't know if I've ever seen someone win from the controlling two full areas, although I'm sure it's happened somewhere. As far as my final thoughts on Lords of Hellas, this is a game that is a 5 out of 5 for me, and I know, I know, I know, I have a reputation at this point, but it has been like 14 videos since my last 5 out of 5, so that's something, right? But anyways, Lords of Hellas is a game that when I first talked about it in some of my unboxings, I said it has the potential to beat my favorite area control game of all time, Blood Rage. And multiple plays has left me still loving Lords of Hellas, still thinking it's an incredible game, but also feeling that Blood Rage is probably safe in its position. You see, Lords of Hellas, for all that I love it, for all that I love the powers, the abilities, the various options of winning, the various pathways, and the unique, fresh aspect of this area control genre that it brings to my table, at 
times it also feels a bit jack of all trades, uh, focusing on different pathways to the exclusion of any one single elegant way of winning. Now, it's interesting because Inish is a game that also has three ways of winning, and yet I feel Inish is very elegant and streamlined in what it does. It's probably good for play this, not that between the two games. I don't have that planned right now. But in any case, something about Lords of Hellas feels a bit messy. I like the game a lot. It works. It's fairly easy to teach, a little bit kind of side rules to be mindful of, but it has powers and abilities. It has some small degree of drafting, not as much as I'd like, but enough that I'm interested. It has gorgeous miniatures, gorgeous production value, pathways to victory, area control, powers and abilities, everything I should love in a game, and I do. It is a 5 out of 5. And yet, at the same time, there's a tiny aspect of feeling like a lot of different things are happening here, and they all work, but they, they kind of just feels messy along the way, if that makes sense. In any case, this is my review of Lords of Hellas, a game that is a 5 out of 5, a game that has some small aspects that I I feel I want something more of. It's a game that I'm very much paying attention to Lords of Ragnarok, which is coming to GameFound, and what that one will be doing differently, because I don't imagine I have room for both of these in my collection. Which one stays, which one goes is a different conversation, and who knows? Expansions may also change where it goes. I don't imagine it shoots it lower, but could push Lords of Hellas higher as well. I haven't haven't played any expansions yet, and I'm intrigued from the different monsters, from the asymmetric armies, from the full other board. I imagine some stuff is probably too much, but some stuff might just be right. Until next time, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co., and I hope you have a good one.